We began this journey a while back on the fruit of the Spirit. We, had, we introduced it one week, and then now we've nine weeks of taking each one of these nine fruit and uh, breaking them out with some biblical examples and multiple references in Scripture, and today we're to the last. Now, the first was, was love, and today we're looking at self-control, and I think those two, those two fruit it's not by accident God does anything and I think love is first because love is primary and love drives the rest and I think self-control is last because self-control is what holds the others together Galatians chapter 5 is where we are I hope at this point you've memorized some scripture because I have shared this verse multiple times every Sunday for 10 weeks now if you don't have anything else memorized, you ought to have the fruit of the Spirit memorized. Here's what it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Do you know anyone who would be described as a control freak in your world? You hear that phrase, right? Control, control freak, where they, they just want to control everybody and everything around them. Uh, they always feel like they know how it ought to work, and they're going to try to make it work that way. And, and if, you, if you've thought about that and no one has come to mind, it's you. That's, that, that's, that's the control freak in your world. And here's what happens. For a lot of people, we like to control, and we all have a little of that in us, we like to control circumstances, and we like to control people, we like to control in the world. But the one thing we're, we're slow to lean into controlling is ourselves. Self-control is where it starts breaking down for us. I have been, I've been asked to control big sweeping things before, like the weather. Hey, Pastor, we had this big outdoor event, and uh, would you mind praying that the weather would be great? And typically, my, my answer to that has been, I'm not really on the management side of this thing. I'm more in the sales department, so I'm probably not the right guy to talk to about that. Now, if you're, if you're trying, and most of us try at all kinds of levels, trying to control other people, you're going to be frustrated too. We try to control spouses and friends and children we try to do a lot of controlling and we can't but with the power of the holy spirit we can learn to control the one person that gives us the most problems in this world and that is us we have found the enemy and he is us teddy roosevelt had this quote and i really liked it he said if you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble you couldn't sit down for a month so before, before we take another step on this day, I need you to raise your right hand. Now, just occasionally play along with me. I know, I know that I have taken advantage of you in the past when I've asked you to do things like this. And today, you're not going to confess any sins randomly or anything like that. This is, this does, it, some of you just non-trusters, aren't you? This is, this is my own fault, and I do take responsibility for it. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me with God's help. I will stop trying to control other people and control things over which I have no control. There we go. Now you've been set free. You're ready to learn some important things about an important part of control, and that is self-control. And we're going to start by trying to answer some questions. Uh, the first one is, is there any area of my life out of control? Now, I didn't intend to tell this until this morning, and I decided I would. So now I'm going off script, and we're going to tell a story. So this week, I met with someone I consider a friend for breakfast at the Allen Cafe. Any of you eaten at the Allen Cafe for breakfast? Now, here's the deal. I'd gone a couple of days into the week where I'd had different things that I'd eaten a lot, and I'd eaten things that weren't really great for me and so okay I gotta you start counting up let's see how long on an elliptical is that gonna take and you, you start factoring that stuff in and you say well that's not worth it so 
we went to Allen Cafe, and I've done it before. I, I, I'm just going to have, I sat down, he was already there. Uh, I'm just going to have the oatmeal. And he's looking at the menu, and he drops his menu down. The, he got there before me, so the waitress came up to him and said, so what are you having? And he said, those of you who are familiar with the place, you know how this works. He said, well, I'm going to have the special. I like the two eggs, I like the bacon, I like the hash browns. Uh, I, the toast or the biscuit? Well, he, he went with the toast. He requested that it be, instead of butter, they just put beef lard on it. And he said, could, could you hook me up to a gravy IV? Just go, just, just go. So they brought a pole over and they hooked him up. And they turned to me. I just thought, man, that's just pitiful. The waiter said, well, you have. I said, well, I have the same thing. It's, that's self-control. So everybody's got their thing, and uh, we wrestle with it. Everyone struggles with self-control somewhere. We wish we had more of it. So here's some, here are three questions we're going we're gonna to pose to look at three areas. This is the beginning and end of all things self-control, but some places we might want to start in the conversation. So here we go. Do you have any uncontrolled appetites? Now, we are given certain appetites for food, drink, pleasure, love, acceptance, a lot of other things. And these are things that we crave. And the other thing is God has given us healthy, godly ways to satisfy our appetites, satisfy our cravings, to get to where we want to get in, a, in the right way that honors God. But here's the thing. The world, uh, the, the devil, and our just sinful inclinations are going to try to overindulge our appetites for all those things. We're going to want more. We're going to want beyond. We're going to want things that are going to ultimately do us some, do us some harm. The Bible at one point, uh, Proverbs 23 says, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, this is just an important figure, consider carefully what's before you, and put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to great appetite. Uh, when appetite, when uh, self-control may be weak and appetite may overwhelm it, uh, beware. A lack of self-control means you want something, and you just have to have it now. There's no, uh, no governor on that thing. You're just going gonna, gonna to go too big, too far, too much, too often. We're not good at delayed gratification. Uh, we look at New Year's resolutions over years, and consumer debt, and diet, what I'm going to eat. I need to lose weight. I need, those things are going to rank right at the top over and over again. And neither one of those things come because we don't have enough, because we're in want. They come because we can't say, no, it's a self-control issue. And we spend too much, we eat too much. Now, uncontrolled appetites. And what we want to do is, I, I'm not, I can't name everything that drives us, but there's something that may be a little bit out of control for you, something that is not where it needs to be, somewhere you just go too far, too often, too much, too dark. Do you have any uncontrolled ambition? Now, God gives us an inclination toward ambitions. There are things, godly ambition, Christ-likeness should be an ambition, a leaning of our heart, a desire of our will, that we'd be more like Jesus. And there's some good amb godly ambitions, and sometimes there are things that are not so good and so godly when it's an uncontrolled ambition. When, when we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, the first week when we introduced the series, we didn't just look at the fruit of the Spirit, which begins in verse 22 and then goes on into verse 23, but we read the things that are just before it. So maybe we call those, instead of the fruit of the Spirit, we call them the weeds of the flesh. They're the things that we're going to do when things are out of control. When self-control is not a part of the picture, these things just start escalating and elevating, and they become out of control with our ambitions. The Bible talks about those things, those sins of the flesh, the 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 sole part of us, not under God's authority. And it mentions selfish ambition in the list. Here's another place in Philippians 2. It says, uh, Paul writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition, there it is, or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. When I think about biblical characters with uncontrolled ambition, the guy I think about is that guy Absalom. 
Absalom was King David's son. Uh, he was, he's an interesting guy. He is described in the Bible as being incredibly handsome, a really charismatic sort of personality. People were drawn to him. And it talks about his hair because he loved his hair. It says he grew the, a lot of hair, and it was full and beautiful, and he cut it once a year. And at the end of the year, when he cut it, he weighed it. Okay, well, you cross some sort of weird, creepy line when you start weighing your hair, right? Well, he is so vain, he's going to, when he cuts it, he's going to weigh it so he can celebrate how beautiful his hair has been. So this is, this is Absalom. He's going to become king when his dad dies, but he doesn't want to wait for that. So he decides, scheme, comes up with this scheme, I'm going to take the throne. So he finds 50 guys to, and th there's a whole lot of his story prior to this, but he decides, I'm going to get 50 guys to run in front of my chariot and just shout out, hey, Absalom's awesome. And they're like an entourage for some sort of rock star. And they go with him everywhere he goes. And then he would position himself at the gate of the city. And the gate is where city leaders sat. And he was a politician to the core. He's going to shake a lot of hands and kiss a lot of babies. And people would come up and he'd say, hey, tell me what's going on. What's not the way you wish it was? And people would say, well, you know, this, this, this. He'd say, man, if I was king, I could make all that right. Sorry, it's my dad. He's... Kind of a slacker on that stuff. Boy, if I was king. And he continues this pattern trying to take over the kingdom because he is, uh, he is covered up in an ungodly ambition. And finally, this hostile takeover came close to working in the end. Right prevailed. Uh, David was restored to the throne. We live in a nation where most people just always want more. Nobody's satisfied. Contentment's not a part of who we are. We want more food. We want more drink. We want more money, more toys, more cars, more channels, more sex, more thrills, more perks, more success. There was a survey done not too long ago. And in this survey, it was a, it was a scientific survey, several thousand people nationwide across multiple economic levels. And they asked them, how much money would you have to make to be happy? And across the board, every economic level, every person to a person, there, was no, there were no exceptions, said, just a little more. Nobody was satisfied with where they were. Nobody was happy. No matter how much they had, everybody wanted more. That's the nature of our culture. Ungodly ambition. Here's the third thing. Do you have uncontrolled anger? Ooh, anger's not a sin, but uncontrolled anger is a sin. The Bible talks about God being angry. Jesus became angry when people were keeping God's people from worshiping the Lord. And so, raging anger, hanging on to anger, really enjoy it, feeding your anger, that's a sin. Paul wrote, be angry and do not sin. This is from, to the Ephesians. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, you can be angry, but there's a, there's a place where you cross a, a, a line that, that it becomes sin. And if you're carrying it over to the next day, that's true in a marriage, that's true in a friendship, you carry an anger over, you're feeding a monster that's going to destroy you. Let me give you an example. This is a college football example. We're in the season. How many of you remember 1978? <laughs> Nobody's going to raise their hand. Oh, I'm not playing anymore. Yeah, 1978. I remember 1978. Many of us do because we're old. Now, here's what, here's what happened in 1978. 1978, the Ohio State Buckeyes, coached by Woody Hayes, were playing Clemson Tigers in the Gator Bowl. And at that time, Woody Hayes was considered one of the most respected coaches in, in the business. He'd won five national championships at Ohio State. Uh, although stories came out since, more people talked about it, that there were a lot of things that were... Uh, not quite as they appeared behind the scenes with his general character, but he's not really remembered for all the wins for the championships and all that. If you think about Woody Hayes today, you remember the Gator Bowl in 1978. And if you remember what happened, there's a it's four, fourth quarter, the Gator Bowl, Charlie Bauman, he's a Clemson nose guard. He intercepted a pass thrown by the Ohio State quarterback, and he starts running it back, and eventually he's run out of bounds onto the Ohio State sidelines where Coach Woody Hayes, who was, was an older guy at the time, ran at him, grabbed his helmet, and then started punching him in the throat. Both benches emptied, and it's just this fiasco of crazy. The next day, this legendary coach, Woody Hayes, was fired. He died nine years later 
as uh, Charlie, the player that he went after, said, he never did apologize for any of that. Uncontrolled anger. The Bible says, a man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. When you lose your temper, you can lose more than your temper. You can lose your job. You can lose some relationships. You can lose the respect of the people around you. Now, second thing. Lack of self-control leads to ruin. It's just going to lead you to ruin. This, this is a verse that, you, it's one of those verses tucked away in the Bible that we don't, it's, it's one you may not ever, ever have uh, highlighted, but it's one that you might want to meditate on. Like put it somewhere where you're going to think about the implications of it and what it means. Uh, this is, when you don't practice self-control, your life may spin out of control sort of verse. The Bible says, in Proverbs, is the words of wisdom. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. In ancient times, these cities had walls. Even small cities, they'd have walls. That was their only protection. Enemy army comes up. They can't, they can't muster an army in a hurry. They just had to hold out. So, but if you had walls, you had some protection. And what he's saying is if, if the city didn't have walls or the walls were broken down, they're vulnerable to every kind of attack and easily destroyed, easily taken advantage of, you'd end up in ruin. And the question, do you have strong walls in your life? I mean, we build, you, you need to build walls. You need to build guardrails around your heart, around your life, around the things that are precious to you. And are the walls solid or are the walls broken down? Do you have some vulnerable spots in the walls around your life, the boundaries around your life? Do you have margin around your life to be able to, to build a personal life that can be protected? Are you, are you just living on the edge, exposed at every turn, to every temptation, to every demand, to every danger? When the walls around your life are broken down, that's what leads to affairs, and it's what leads to addictions, and it's what leads to breakdowns, because self-control uh, is not so good, and things start to unravel in a hurry. There's another Bible character I want to use an example on uh, this self-control, lack of self-control leading to ruin. And that is the guy, Samson. Now, you know, you've heard the story of Samson. Samson is the strong man in the Bible. God gave him supernatural strength. He's born to godly, godly parents. And we know they, they raised him right. They're just wired that way. And that's why God entrusted this special guy, Samson, to them. And he's raised under the Nazarite vow. And there are all kinds of things wrapped around the Nazarite vow. There are things that he could do, things he couldn't do. But the Nazarite vow was a public representation of his personal commitment to his God. Here's what happened. That just started wavering. And walls around his life broke down. And in the story, and most of you are familiar with it, even if you're not a Bible reader. You haven't been in church a lot. You've heard, you've seen movies and things with the Samson story. And so Delilah, she cuts his hair and then, oh, his strength goes away. His, just, just so you understand, the, his strength was never in his hair. That's like a fairy tale. The strength was in his commitment to the Lord. The hair was just the last part of that commitment to go away. It was the last thing. He'd already, he'd already compromised on all the rest of that vow. This was just the last thing. And when it went away, so did his strength. So here's how it works. A reckless life, no boundaries. And by the way, uh, the reason Delilah factors in so prominently is because if you read prior to her story, when it comes to his boundaries and when it comes to his walls in his life, he was a he-man with a whole lot of she problem on all kinds of levels. Delilah comes into his life. She pretended to love him, although she, on the side, and clearly she's a spy for the Philistines. They're the they're the enemy culture in the area that just made God's people miserable. And she begs Samson, oh, please, 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 you got to tell me, you got to reveal, what's the secret of your strength? And he throws down all kinds of crazy ideas, and she tries all of them. He's not very smart because, you think, okay, every time I give her a, oh, here's where my strength is, she does exactly that. And then here come all the Philistines all of a sudden. Isn't that a cause effect? You know, sometimes with the, that, that's the walls really down. You don't even see cause effect anymore. And then finally, she just wears him down. And he says, well, it's my hair. He cut my hair. I'm just like everybody else. I'm just a regular guy. 
And so he's asleep, and she cuts his hair. Samson, Samson. This is how the Bible says, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, These are two of the saddest statements in the Bible to me. I will go out as at other times. I'll whoop the Philistines before, I'll whoop them again. So I'm just going to get up and go out just like I did before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. His guardrails, his walls were so broken down, he couldn't even tell the difference between God with him and God not with him. The last thread of his commitment to the Lord had been compromised and The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, brought him to Gaza, and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground at the mill in the prison. He really expected the power of God to be there, and it was gone. And he had traveled down this slippery slope of losing all self-control. Compromise after compromise after compromise. And then he woke up, and he found himself alone. And that's what people find at the end of a slippery slope of forgetting commitment to God and the walls come down a third thing I want to talk about self-control by the way for those of you who tuned out early for those of you who are making plans to tune out late just remember this one thing I put it right in the middle remember this one thing today and we're all good on self-control self-control means giving control of myself to Jesus that's what self-control is it's, it's not self-improvement. It, it's not trying harder. It's, not a, it, it's just saying, Jesus, I'm giving all of this to you. You and I can never control ourselves in our own strength. It just doesn't work. It, we can't do it. So the only hope I have is to surrender myself to Jesus. We talk about putting your faith in Jesus. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. I put my faith in that. But see, to be saved, there's got to be a surrender. You turn over the reins of your life to him. He's the king. He's in charge. He's the boss. And it has to be both of those things involved because a lot of people know about God, but they don't have any kind of relationship with him. The surrender part says, I'm in a relationship. In Luke 9, 23, here's how Jesus talked about it. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That doesn't mean you... Oh, I'm going to deny, like uh, people do it in uh, Lenten season. I'm going to deny myself chocolate for a few weeks. Oh, look at the sacrifice I'm making for God. It's a lot bigger than that. It's to deny yourself. And and that means to deny your sinful nature. Deny the sinful you. The the, the you that this is the best I'm ever going to be. The the best I can ever do. I'm I'm not going to put my faith there. Not that Selfish part of my personality that says, I want more, I want other, I want different. It boils down to this. Who's in charge of your life? And is it going to be you or is it going to be Jesus? That's where the self-control comes in. Is Jesus in control? Am I in control? Now, I wonder if the Lord doesn't look at us with great frustration at times on this particular matter. And when we neglect his word, when we, we fail to spend time with him in prayer, when we're not doing the things he has clearly told us to do in order to grow, in order to become, in order to serve, in order to be, he has to ask, so who's in char- who is in charge? Is it, is it me, the Lord God, or is it, is it you? Self-control simply means, Lord, you're in charge of my life, and that means I'm going to deny myself daily, and I'm going to follow him couple things. Letter A on this particular point. Jesus in me will say no to the wrong things. And that's how that part works. Jesus in me is going to say no to the wrong things. When uh, Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States, his wife Nancy, First Lady, she led uh, an emphasis. You remember what it was? Just say no. Just say no to drugs. And students in schools were challenged to say no, to, to make a pledge. They're not going to experiment even with drugs. They're going to say no to drugs. And it made, I think, some good headway in some places. But the problem with just saying no to drugs is that most of us can't even say no to donuts. And, and, and I know that you just came from classes where some of you, you 
and you know who you are. And uh, yeah, you can't even say no to donuts. So just saying no to drugs, things start breaking down there pretty quick. It's not as easy as just saying no. Saying no is hard because our willpower isn't strong enough to carry through on so many things. And basically, that's what God told Adam and Eve to do. Adam, Eve, say no to the forbidden fruit. You know how that worked out for all of us. Each of us needs a supernatural power within, a strength that is beyond our best intentions to say no. And that's what Jesus does when you surrender control to him. Then he's in charge and he knows when to say no. The Bible says, for, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And there's a key phrase for us in that verse. Training us to renounce, which means say no to, ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. Training us, it means we're going to have to learn it. He's, but he's not going to leave us to guess. He's going to help us. He's going to walk with us, empower us to live this life. He trains us to, to say no to the things that are wrong. And also to say yes, and this is the next thing, Jesus in me will say yes to the right things. We all love to hear the word yes. Oh, if you're proposing to someone, you want to hear yes. If you're applying for a job, you want to hear yes. If you're applying for a scholarship, you want to hear yes. And I think, I think really, and I don't know what your view of God is on this, but I think one of God's favorite words is yes. Sometimes we think of God as like a cosmic school teacher that he's just waiting to slap you on the wrist with a ruler and tell you no, 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 no. Cosmic killjoy. But that's not the nature of God. God loves to say yes. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. He wants to say yes to all the right things. And to guide you in those things. The struggle with our sinful nature isn't so much uh, the cartoon version where, well, I have, a, I have a good angel on this shoulder and I have a bad angel on this shoulder and I have to listen to the right one and, that's, and make the right choice about good angel, bad angel whispering into my ear and, and I hope that I get it right. Because the other option is Jesus lives in you and he always says yes to the right things. And he always is going to say no to the wrong things. And the only thing we need to say is yes to Jesus. And then he's running the show. And, and I don't have to try to sort through all that one decision at a time. When he, I've surrendered my life to him, a lot of those things are just going to be taken care of because Jesus is going to make the call, and I don't have to worry about it. I just allow Jesus to make the choice for me. Now... Jesus said, and this is an absolute truth, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We have freedom in Christ. We're not, we're not just slaves to anything and everything. Uh, now, in the context of self-control, we are free in Christ, forgiven, on our way to heaven. So here's your road, but here's what happens. Paul writes to the church at Galatia, and he says, there are a couple things you might want to keep an eye on. There's a ditch on this side of the road, and there's a ditch on this side of the road. There's a ditch of shamelessness on this side that says, I'm free in Christ. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I've been forgiven. Let grace, let my sin abound, let grace abound all the more. I'm just going to sin, 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 so there'll be that much more grace, and we'll just celebrate it some more. And it's just an ongoing party of recklessness shamelessness and that's one of the ditches that in freedom in Christ some people head into that ditch anything's okay everything's okay the other side the other ditch is legalism we've got a rule and a regulation for everything and we're checking a lot of boxes and it's stiff and it's cold and lifeless and spirit of godless and into such a world comes a need for the fruit of the spirit which is self-control because self-control means I say no to all that God forbids and I say yes to all that God ordains. But this, it's more than that. It's I say, I say no to that which 
just may not be beneficial. It may not be helpful. It may do damage to others. It may be fine for me, but damaging to others. I may say no to that. And I may say yes to some things that they aren't directly ordered in the Bible. You have to do this. And yet, to be a blessing to others, to take a next step in connection, connecting someone with the gospel, I may find something that is beyond just the daily adult requirement of obedience. Here's the big bottom line in this fruit. Self-control is wrapped up in the message of the gospel. It's, it's all about the gospel. Self-control is not a matter of self-improvement. It's not just trying harder. It's, it's about the gospel. And I want to finish up with this story. And this story comes from, comes from the story of Paul, the apostle, talking to a governor named Felix. And Felix, Paul was in prison in Caesarea. There's Caesarea Philippi way up in the north. There's Caesarea by the sea that's on the coast. Caesarea Maritime. And Paul is in prison, Caesarea by the sea. Felix is the governor, and they get into a conversation. And here's what the Bible says about their conversation, that Paul talked to Felix about faith in Jesus Christ. And here's why. Because until you talk about Jesus, you don't know where the conversation needs to go. Until you've settled the Jesus, faith in Jesus question, you may just spend your, you're trying to tell people you should be a better person. Well, you can't without Jesus. So you need to get to the gospel first. That's why in our, in our community outreach that so many of you are part of, we're, we're focusing on the gospel first. Get that gospel conversation on the table early. Then we can do a lot of detail breaking it out and, and working on the details. But until the gospel's on the table, we don't know what the conversation needs to be. Here's what it says. He, Felix, sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ, Christ Jesus, and he reasoned about, and he mentions three things, righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. That self-control is wrapped up in the story of the gospel. This isn't a, a faraway thing. This isn't way down the road after I've been a Christian a long time, I'm going to start practicing self-control. This is something that's on the, it's on the front burner. There's a historian from the, from the biblical period. His name is uh, Tacitus. And he, he writes about, this guy Felix. Here's what he said about him. With savagery and lust, he exercised the power of a king with the disposition of a slave. Now, that's kind of harsh. We know he was married to Drusilla. Drusilla was his wife. Drusilla was his third wife. Drusilla was still under the age of 20 when they have this encounter with the Apostle Paul. She's under the age of 20. She was, she'd already been married and divorced by the time she was 16. Now, when it comes to, uh, to Felix, he had some issues with self-control. And it's important to note that Paul said, in the presentation of the gospel, self-control needs to be a part of this conversation early on. Paul started out, he talks about the righteousness of God. There are things that are right before God. There are things that are wrong. Things you do, things you don't do. Right relationship to God, right relationship to others is what righteousness is. And God sets the standards of what those things are. We don't self-identify. We don't declare them out of our own heart. It comes out of God's word, God's truth, God's heart. To live rightly, decisions have to be made about choices. And some things are clearly right and wrong. In Felix's case, you look at his story. There were issues in his story related to, when it came to righteousness, the treatment of women, the exercise of power, and the abuse of privilege. I think, wow, he ought to run for office. How many stories like that have arisen over the last few years with public figures in politics or in sports on those three things? Treatment of women, exercise of power, abuse of privilege. So this is going to have to be some self-control because it's a key to where his, sin, where his walls are broken down. And quite often, here's what we find too. The wrong choices can often be the most attractive to us because of our sinful nature. And the right choice is the one that's most difficult, most demanding, is going to require the most of us. And so we have to lean against our natural uh, sinful inclinations. So here's Felix. He had made plenty of wrong choices, and so much of it wrapped up in his lack of self-control, and it led to all kinds of problems for him. His job is on the line. He's under all kinds of pressures. Uh, but Paul, I want you to notice this part about Paul. Paul didn't say, we need to do some behavior modification with you. You need to stop doing these bad things, start doing these right things, and everything's going to be great. 
Because the Bible says he talked to him about faith in Christ. He talked to him about righteousness. And he talked to him about the coming judgment. Because Paul wasn't just, okay, well, let's clean it up so everything works better here right now. Which most of, our, m- most of what happens in, in our world is behavior modification. Just try harder, do better, and everything's great. But he says, this is about relationship to God stuff and about eternity. Of, it's heaven and hell. And it, it, now, how often have you heard someone say, hey, don't judge me. You can't judge me. What well, shows up regularly? Only God can judge me. Well, this is the part that people need to understand. And this is what Felix, I mean, Paul had no rights to judge Felix, the governor. Here's the part Paul understood. God will judge us, everyone. God's judgment is clear and fierce and, and, and complete. We will all stand before God and give an accounting for our lives. He does bring judgment. And on sinners without a Savior, oh, that judgment is horrible. So Paul, he wants him to know about faith in Christ. He wants that to be different. Paul is concerned about his eternal soul. And the only way his eternal soul is going to be made right is not by trying, to, trying harder and doing, making good choices. It's about reconciliation to God. It's about forgiveness of sin. And it's about surrender of his life to a Savior. Now, that's the shamelessness side. On the other side is the legalism. That other ditch we get into. The religious leader of Jesus, leaders of Jesus' day, this is them. He criticized them. And not for the outside being messed up. Not for lack of self-control in the details. Because you look at these guys. and They prayed and they gave and they fasted. And they never missed a, a church gathering. They were going to get all that stuff done. The outward things. But Jesus said to them. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate. Oh, you're doing all your religious stuff on the outside. A lot of people do that. But inside, oh, inside, you're full of greed and self-indulgence is the word Jesus uses. Instead of self-control, self-indulgence, just whatever, whatever I want on the inside is all okay. And it's not just about the stuff we do on the outside. It's the things we do. What's, what's happened in her heart, it's not checking boxes. Oh, I did a good thing, good thing, good thing, good thing, good thing. I'm a good person. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And there can be a storm raging on the inside of temptation, selfishness, greed, darkness. If you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your only hope of forgiveness of sin, and relationship to God and eternal life. If you have never surrendered your life to Him, stop trying to manage your sin like a Pharisee and stop, stop trying to feed that sin nature like Felix. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's always the chance that in our freedom in Christ, we, we can start to drift to one ditch or the other. And self-control needs to be a part of our lives. There are a lot of, there are a lot of details about this. It's a, it's a relationship to God. It's an everyday journey. Here's, here's how Peter talked about this in Second Peter. He said, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue... Is it your faith, your relationship to Christ with virtue? You're doing the right things that are going to honor God. Your virtue with knowledge, you need to learn more and more all the time about what that relationship looks like and what's right and what's wrong. You're growing all the time. Knowledge with self-control, you, 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 you're, you're, you're turning control over to him because self-control is ultimately Jesus' control. Self-control with steadfastness. You're going to be true to him, and you're not going to be running off into the ditches, but you're going to stay, you're going to stay true to the Lord, steadfastness with godliness, which means it's what happens on the outside, but it's also what's happening on the inside. And then brotherly affection, brotherly affection love, which means this isn't just about me. It's about me in relationship to my world, to my family, to my friends, to my coworkers, to my neighbors, to the random strangers I, I meet on the street that my relationship to God just always spills out. Now, we have said from the first week, 
When it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, this is always something that ought to be growing and ought to be bubbling up in us in such a way that it's all spilling out into a world that's just desperate for a, a real touch, a real view, a real experience with Jesus. And the fruit of the Spirit is the clearest, finest, fullest reflection of Jesus that we can do as Christ followers. And self-control just holds them all together. We started, when we introduced the series back in August, with, with a statement, because we were coming out of a long series about what it means to follow Jesus. And there are plenty of examples of following Jesus and what a follower of Jesus is. Lots of people say, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple. They, they lay that down over and over and over and over again. But here's the truth of God's word. If you're not following Jesus, the way this book described, not as self-identifying, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus, and here's what that looks like, because I made up a religion. But what this book says, if you're not following Jesus, here's the mathematics of this, you're not a follower of Jesus. I'm amazed at how many people are shocked by that kind of a statement, but it has to be true. If you're not following, you're not a follower. And there's certain things that you're going to do, and that's how we started the series uh, back in the summer. There's certain things that you do when you follow Jesus. And the fruit of the Spirit says there's certain things that you are when you follow Jesus. There are certain things that are going to pop up, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things are going to pop up, and they're just going to spill out when you follow Jesus. And if those things aren't showing up in ever-increasing ways, the longer you, you lean into this, the, the long, then, then we need to back up, like Paul did with Felix, and say, let's talk about faith in Christ. Because there are a lot of cultural Christians in America. That's just the facts. A lot of people, I'm a cultural Christian because I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not something else. Uh, this seemed to fit the way I think about the world as well as anything. And so I, you know, I go to church and I do nice things. And, and yet the relationship to God, if you're a follower, there's certain things you do. If you're a follower, there's certain things you are. And those are the things we're looking for. Those are the things, that, and goodness, again, I can't judge an eternal soul, but I can, in the Bible, multiple places, judge fruit. Jesus says he does. Jesus says we can. By your fruits, you will know them. And I want to encourage you. If this is not clear, if this is unsettled, if, if really this has been, when we think about following Jesus and being a follower of Jesus, if, if there's a step that needs to be taken... Today's a good step, good day to take a step. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, you know about Jesus, you know this story, but there's never been a transaction take place between your heart and God's heart where you surrendered, asking for his forgiveness for your sin because you can't do it yourself. Putting all your faith in Jesus is the one and only way you're ever going to have your sin forgiven, you're ever going to be in heaven. And surrendering your life to him that he's... He's going to make the call because he'll always say yes to what's right. and He'll always say no to what's wrong before God. Then today, give your life to Jesus.